Good morning, everyone. And those of you who are in uh, the room, welcome to uh, uh, Peter Coldrake Education Precinct. I'm not sure if everyone knows that this is, that's the name of this building. And welcome everyone on Zoom, uh, wherever you are. And uh, allow me to first also acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where we're meeting this morning and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. So my name is uh, Patrick Wickstrom. I am director for the um, Digital Media Research Center. And I have the privilege to um, welcome you all and to open this exciting symp symposium that we have today, uh, uh, which is the 2021 uh, Digital Public Symposium Information Disorders. Before we get started, I'd just like to say a few words about the Digital Media Research Center. If there is anyone uh, online or in the room who uh, might not be familiar with what we're doing. So we are uh, a bunch, a pretty big bunch, maybe a bit more than 100 researchers and research students from communication, media, law and computer science who are passionate about uh, research to uh, build a, a thriving and, and a more flourishing digital society. And we study a whole range of things, such as digital inclusion in, in regional Australia. We study the transformation of media industries. We uh, uh, look at uh, uh, methods for, for computational um, 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 communication research. And we do whatever, uh, obviously, what we'll be talking about today. Uh, information in, in social media networks, in public communication and um, issues about misinformation, disinformation, uh, I shouldn't say fake news, but I'm saying that anyway, uh, and how that might lead to things such as uh, polarization, et cetera, et cetera. So strap in for a really exciting uh, uh, symposium today. And I'd like to thank you already, even though we're at the beginning of the, uh, um, the program this morning, to thank Axel and team for, for all the work that you put into this and for, to Caroline Keating, who is uh, 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 one of the, the powers behind the scenes who've set this up. So with that, uh, welcome everyone, uh, and uh, I hand over to, to Axel. Thanks, Patrick, and uh, yes, welcome everyone, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands upon which we meet as well, of course. Um, and uh, the traditions on, traditional owners of the lands upon which everyone who's on Zoom uh, is, uh, is located as well, of course. Uh, so thank you all for coming along in the room. It's wonderful to have a, a, an event where we can actually have people in the room again. And uh, to those of you who are on Zoom and couldn't be here today, hopefully we will see you uh, again sometime soon in person as well. Um, we have quite a, a, a detailed, quite a packed program. Um, this event really came together because so many of us have had papers, presentations, research that we've not had a chance to present over the last couple of years, uh, really present properly. We've recorded short videos and all sorts of things, but just haven't been able to really get together and, and present this as a, as a package, as something that, that really is a, a, quite a significant and quite a detailed contribution to the study of information disorder in many different ways, and from many different angles, as you'll see through the day. So um, we really wanted to bring together all these wonderful researchers who you'll see today and uh, um, present this work in, in, its, in its full breadth and depth um, in a single symposium day. Um, uh, and uh, obviously stream this as well, record it as well, so there will be a, a permanent record of this as well, and, and hopefully that will be useful for others who are um, engaged in, in this kind of research. So I'm, I'm really pleased that we've had such a great response from everyone around the DMRC and their collaborators. Um, this is not entirely limited to DMRC folks, but uh, there's quite a few collaborations with others that you'll hear about today as well. Um, so it's, it's really, really uh, wonderful to see this. And that's just, as Patrick said, just one part of what the DMRC does, of course, in the Digital Publics program. So there's quite a bit more of the work that we do um, that we will and we are talking about in other events, of course, as well. Um, just before we get started, um, uh, you know, a bit of housekeeping, of course, as always. Um, if there's a fire, walk, don't run, um, and take the stairs, not the lifts. Uh, the stairs are just outside. 
Um, try to observe physical distancing where that's possible. Um, we have sanitizer uh, on the tables as well. In fact, DMRC branded sanitizer even, so uh, please take it home and share it with your friends. Um, uh, and a few other kind of uh, goodies there on the tables as well. So by all means, um, uh, feel free to take those along with you as well. Um, uh, for those of you who are presenting, just very quickly, we have all of your presentations in a single um, uh, PowerPoint, so all you need to do as you're presenting is to click forward and then hand over to the next person. Uh, we'll make sure that you stay to time, and at the end of each of the sessions, of course, we'll have about 15 minutes for Q&A as well. So in each session, we'll hold uh, uh, questions until then, uh, if you're online as well, um, please use the Q&A function to ask questions, and we'll get back to those and read them out at the end of the session as well so that you can participate too. Um, so yeah, please uh, uh, jump in and, and ask questions as well if you're online. And um, we have a small number of uh, presenters as well who will be presenting online because we have some PhD students and other, other colleagues who are still uh, stuck overseas or interstate and couldn't be here in person. Uh, so there's a handful of presentations that will be over Zoom rather than in the room. Um, that's probably all I need to say in terms of housekeeping. One other really important part of this is that there will be drinks afterwards. Um, sorry, just for those of you who are in the room, obviously, um, unless you can suddenly fly in. Um, so at the end of the session today, we'll wander down to the La Boite Cafe, and there will be drinks there. Uh, Patrick's put on a, a, a bar tab, so um, come on down and, uh, um, and have a drink with us and celebrate the work that we've all been doing. Um, have a chat with your presenters and uh, ask them about fake news um, and all these things. Uh, so yeah, please come on down afterwards and, and have a drink with us. And this, is, this then doubles as our kind of end of year celebration for digital publics as well. Um, that's, I think, everything I have to say just by way of introduction to the day overall. Um, now, we wanted to start the day, obviously, with a keynote speaker not from the DMRC um, to really connect what we do also with, uh, with the rest of the world, which has been difficult over these last two years, obviously. Um, and it's, it's been a great pleasure for me that the first person I asked also said yes, and that was Kate Starbird. Um, and, um, you know, I, I and I think a number of us have been following Kate's work for some time. Um, there were quite a few oohs and ahs when we announced that Kate was going to be the keynote speaker, so that's a, that's a great sign that um, what she has to say is, of course, to, of great interest to many of us. Um, so I'm, I'm really pleased that we've been able to uh, arrange for Kate to be uh, on Zoom and do the keynote for us, um, uh, and that I think it's even at a reasonably uh, you know, okay hour for her in, uh, in, on the west coast of the US. So I'm, I'm very happy that, uh, that Kate said yes. If you don't know about Kate, Kate is an associate professor in the Department of Human-Centered uh, Design and Engineering at the University of Washington. Um, Kate's research is situated within human-computer interaction and the emerging field of crisis informatics. Um, in fact, while I do this, I'll just switch over to her slide as well. Um, uh, the, so she's in the field of crisis informatics, uh, the study of how social media and other information communication technologies are used during crisis events. Uh, her work currently fo focuses on the production and spread of online rumors, misinformation and disinformation uh, during crises, including natural disasters, political disruption, and a global pandemic uh, that probably doesn't need to be named here. Um, in particular, she investigates the participa participatory nature of online disinformation campaigns, exploring both top-down and bottom-up dynamics. Um, uh, she's received her Bachelor of Science in Computer Science from Stanford in 1997, her PhD in Technology, Media, and Society from the University of Colorado in uh, 2012, and she's a co-founder and current faculty director of the University of Washington Center for an Informed Public. Um, so I think a lot of connections between her work and what we do here as well. Um, I will hand over to Kate now. Um, Kate, if you can make sure that you record on your end as well, please, uh, as we get started, that would be great. All right, thank you. Um, thank you for that introduction. I'm so sorry I can't be there with you all today, but I am i um, happy to be with you virtually and I'm very excited to give this talk. I'm going to try one more time to share the right screen. Um, 
All right. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm super happy to, to, to share this with you and, and looking forward to the conversations we'll hopefully have uh, afterwards. Um, today I'm presenting uh, on, um, on the disinformation around the 2020 election here in the United States. Uh, and the talk is called Unraveling the Big Lie uh, and Thinking about Participatory Disinformation and its Threat to Democracy. And hopefully I will define that term and help you understand uh, what I mean by that and why I think it's a threat to democracy, not just here in the United States, but elsewhere around the world. Before I go too far, I just wanna note that there's just a ton, a ton of people that are a part uh, of this research that, that we've been doing now at the University of Washington and with collaborators at, at Stanford and other places. And we've got an array of different funders that I just wanna to note and give, give credit to here. Cause I, I always forget when I leave the slide to the end. And also just to mention, we've got the new Center for Informed Public at the University of Washington. We have folks like a data engineer, Paul Lockerbie, and it's just, uh, just given been a force multiplier for our work and happy to talk about the structure of our center and how that's enabled us to do the work I'll talk about today um, uh, after, after this during the Q&A if you all are interested. All right, so un unraveling the big lie, uh, where, where do I even start? I mean, there's a lot of different um, entry points to this kind of conversation. One place to start is here. Um, with uh, this sort of now familiar photograph of protesters slash insurrectionists who were wandering the Capitol building on January 6, 2021. Um, this photo features the QAnon shaman, um, a, someone who was a notable figure. Actually, when I saw this live, I actually recognized this person because I had, had seen him before in some of the data we'd looked at. Um, and this photo underscores that this insurrection attempt was, among other things, a social media enabled phenomenon with the symbols and memes of internet culture come alive. Another place we can start is here with the view from outside of the Capitol building that day with a collection of flags, um, Trump flags, American flags, Confederate flags, um, proudly waved by a group of activists who had overtaken the US Capitol building on that day or the Capitol grounds on that day and eventually the building as well. Their garb, what they're wearing includes the red, white and blue of US patriotism as well as Trump support. Um, and also the camouflage and pr protective gear of militia and military um, that become salient as we see the violence unfold that day. For some insight into what motivated that insurrection attempt, we could also look to the Twitter account of the US president that day, where he repeats the false claim that his sacred landslide victory had been stolen from him and his followers, and where he seems to refer to the insurrectionists as patriots. This tweet was a long series going back to the summer of 2020, where Donald Trump attempted to sow doubt in the US presidential election. Today, I'm gonna to talk about that work to sow doubt in the election, um, or what has become to be known as the big lie, uh, I'm gonna talk about that uh, effort as a disinformation campaign. And as I do that, I'm gonna borrow a little bit from Bankler and his colleagues. We've been talking about disinformation as well, but I wanna point out that back in October of 2020, before the election, Bankler, Yokai Bankler and his colleagues described the effort to discredit the mail-in voting process as a coordinated elite driven disinformation campaign. And I wanna note that that due to COVID and some other things, there had been an effort to use mail-in voting in some places that hadn't used it before or at a scale that it hadn't been used before in the United States. And that provided an entry point for some of these um, disinformation efforts, but eventually it became much broader than that. So we accepted that sort of disinformation framing that Bankler and his colleagues put forward and we and extended it to the broader efforts to sow doubt in the election procedures and eventually to try to discredit the election results, um, which were part of what motivated the, the violence on January 6. So this disinformation campaign was, and actually still is, an attack on democracy itself. It's meant to undermine our trust in the democratic process. These kinds of things aren't just happening in the United States, but here I'm gonna focus on, on this particular um, campaign, which was very US focused. Before I go too far, I wanna do a little definitional, definitional work to make sure we're all on the same page. I know many of you are familiar with some of the terminology, but some of this terminology is slipping and moving. It's a little dynamic. And the way I use terms may not be the same way that others use terms. So I wanna give um, a little bit of, of my definitions here. I'll start by unpacking and differentiating between misinformation and disinformation. 
Um, of course, this difference is extremely important, um, but misinformation is information that's false, but not necessarily intentionally false. Whereas disinformation is information that's false or misleading, that's purposefully seeded and or spread for a specific objective, for instance, a financial or a political objective. And I think the intentionality here is very um, important. And also I wanna point out that disinformation isn't just false information, it's false or misleading, and I'll get back to that. So um, effective disinformation isn't necessarily false, but it's misleading. It's often built around this true or plausible core and then layered with distortions and exaggerations intended to shape how others perceive reality. And it functions not just as a single piece of content, but as a campaign, um, an assemblage of different information actions. And so through this view, disinformation can sometimes be resistant to simple fact checking about a single piece of content. It can't always be reduced to simply false information or a false piece of information because it's a campaign and sort of a, an effort through multiple kind of moves that sometimes include true information um, that is selectively amplified and distorted subtly um, to create false impressions. And then additionally, and this is a tricky one, because a lot of people really get stuck on that intentionality. So disinformation is intentional, but um, many participants in a disinformation campaign are unwitting agents. They're un unaware that the information that they're spreading is false, and they're unaware of their role in the larger campaign. And um, we borrow this language actually from Lawrence Bittman, who was a, a practitioner of disinformation. Um, he's a, a, a Soviet disinformation historically who became um, a, a um, researcher in disinformation. He has a couple of really great books that are published around 1985 or so that really highlight these kind of strategies. And he uses this term and, and describes it very well. And this is exactly what we're seeing now is that most of the spreaders of disinformation in the, in the kinds of campaigns we've studied are, are unwitting agents in those campaigns. All right, so I wanna talk a little bit about um, a tale of two elections. I wanna set up 2020, but first I wanna go back a little bit in time to 2016 in the United States, um, because I think it kind of reveals a, a little bit in the evolution of, of the story of disinformation and how we as a research community are thinking about disinformation. And so 2016, uh, we had Brexit, there were some other things going on. Um, and when we think in the US, about the US election in 2016, when we think about the story of disinformation in that election, we think of it predominantly as one of, of disinformation that was foreign in origin, perpetrated by inauthentic actors, networks of fake accounts, and coordinated by various agencies in Russia. Now, there were also, it was also part of a wider campaign that had other elements and a hack and leak operation as well. Um, but the social media part, part of that disinformation campaign was foreign, inauthentic, and coordinated. Of course, that wasn't the whole story. There was a lot of other things going on, but that was the one we told ourselves that was the one that a lot of researchers focused on, you know, bots and trolls. It was a really e easy focus for us um, that allowed us to, to kind of um, isolate this external problem that, that we have to come together to solve. And, and I think it was very um, simplistic and, and politically easier to discuss in those terms. Um, and certainly there was a foreign and authentic coordinated aspect to the disinformation we were seeing around, around that election and, and interference. Now, fast forward to 2020, we saw a very different story around disinformation in the US election. It was largely domestic coming from inside the United States. There were foreign activities at, at part of these conversations, but they weren't playing a, a major role. Um, most of the accounts perpetrating this, in the, not even the accounts, most of the entities perpetrating this disinformation campaign, as, as we and, and Blanco and colleagues saw it, were um, their authentic accounts. They were often blue check and verified accounts. They were pundits on cable television shows that were who they saw, said they were, along with you know, some other anonymous members of, of the connected crowd online. But a lot of the major spreaders were blue check accounts. And it wasn't entirely coordinated. But instead, it was largely sort of cultivated and even organic in places with everyday people creating and spreading disinformation about the election. And I'm going to describe for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to describe some of those dynamics and highlight a couple of examples to really drive this home. Um, and I'm going to talk about this as a participatory disinformation campaign. 
Um, but before I get into that, I want to talk a little bit uh, about how we conducted this research and about sort of this novel collaboration that was going on um, during the election season. So um, we were um, collaborating um, with three other research organizations at Stanford, Graphica, DFR Lab, as well as working with a range of partners in the U.S. government, across civil society, and even at the tech platforms to um, uh, do this sort of multi-stakeholder collaboration around rapid response to disinformation. And this group was called the Election Integrity Partnership. And um, through it, we worked to identify, analyze, and respond to election-related mis- and disinformation in real time. So a lot of the data that I'm going to talk about today, we were initially curating in real time and then later did, did, a, did more deep analysis that I'll, that I'll show you. Um, a little bit about how that collaboration worked. Um, in case you wanted to peek under the hood. So we had um, our collaboration would solicit tips or reports from external partners. They could sort of send us a tip in, in, a, in, a, in an enclosed system. And we also had shifts of workers working in real time to sort of monitor different websites in different um, places to gather information as well. And those would go to try to detect emergent disinformation campaigns. We were, gonna, we were trying to find things before they went viral. We would quickly assess each report finding ones that were relevant and prioritizing content that was moving quickly. And then we would eventually identify specific reports that were um, in need of more in-depth analysis. And then we would you know, conduct that analysis over the course of 24 hours or a couple of days and get that analysis out to, to stakeholder groups and the public at large to show them you know, where a piece of mis or disinformation came from and how it was reaching so many people. So we can kind of uh, unwind that intentionality underneath some, how some of these things were going viral. Eventually, we ended up detecting and analyzing hundreds of unique incidents of false or misleading information about the election. Um, we also collected hundreds of millions of social media posts related to these reports. We have an infrastructure to collect that data in real time. And we analyzed hundreds of, of, of reports. We did a deep analysis of, of hundreds of reports, including uh, use, oh, sorry, using this rapid response model that integrated open source investigative techniques with visualization, network analysis, and lightweight NLP tools. So um, we actually uh, started out um, looking, we didn't focus on all election related misinformation. We were really focused on misinformation, disinformation, targeting election procedures. So about the vote itself, not about the candidates and their political positions or what their children were doing, but really about the election it itself um, and focusing on um, election procedures, voter suppression, intimidation and fraud. And then eventually, um, this was always part of our focus, but this became the biggest focus um, became um, on these efforts to delegitimize the election through false claims of voter fraud. Uh, so in, in, over time, we began to focus more and more on this because it became the, the biggest, the most salient um, kind of mis and disinformation in, in the in the tips that we were receiving and the monitoring that we were doing. So if anyone's interested in reading about that collaboration or those findings, there's like a 400 page report, which details all of that. And I'm gonna summarize a couple of different um, salient pieces here. So when it comes to our analysis, a team that, that our, our, our team does, and I think some of the other teams as well, the Graphica and Stanford and, and DFR lab, we use, a, we use a mixed method approach where we blend qualitative, quantitative and visual analyses to understand both the structure and dynamics of, uh, in this case, election-related mis- and disinformation. And we tend to move back and forth between, you know, visualizations or quantifications of things at a, at a high level, like, you know, 30,000 feet, and then doing much closer content, qualitative content analysis, our tweet-by-tweet -tweet view. And so we move back and forth between those views to gain a real nuanced and, um, and in-depth understanding of things that are going on. So as I mentioned above, our, our collaborative team identified and analyzed hundreds of distinct incidents of false or misleading information about alleged voter fraud. And they were connected to dozens of different narratives. So this work sort of under, underscores that the big lie was much more than a single false claim or narrative. It weaved together many different narratives from false claims about large numbers of dead people voting to false claims about voting machines and voting software. Um, ch changing votes and all sorts of other things in between. The effect was to create this false perception based on a combination or just like a spaghetti on the wall, like so many different um, exaggerations, fabrications of, of uh, and claims of massive and systemic voter fraud. Um, 
And so in one sense, this disinformation campaign was a top-down effort. And it was spread through the massive megaphones of political elites to their audiences. The it, it, one primary conveyor of these messages was the former president himself. In this tweet, which was posted back in June of 2020, um, President Trump claimed that the election would be rigged, that ballots would be printed and ostensibly filled out in foreign countries, and that it would be the scandal of our times. And so this was June of 2020, many months before the election, which was in November. Um, this tweet received hundreds of thousands of engagements and uh, likes and retweets. And those were pretty typical numbers for um, President Trump's uh, Twitter account at that time, where a lot of very dedicated followers would systematically retweet just about everything that he posted. If we look more broadly across the course of the, across the, overall election 2020 conversation, we actually find a finite number of what we call repeat offenders who were, were repeatedly influential, highly reshared or retweeted, repeatedly influential in the spread of content related to the big lie. And before I go deeply into that, I wanna talk a little bit about where these folks were politically. So um, this is a network graph we created. It's one of several artifacts that we would repeatedly use in our analyses. And then we actually took not just data about voter fraud, we took all data we were collecting about voting, ballots, elections, or whatever. And we created this sort of collapsed graph of influencers where um, each node is an influential account and they're, they get connected when many other accounts retweeted both of them. So they're kind of, it, it, it's, it's got some, it collapses a very, complex and massive network into a much smaller one where we're just looking at the influencers. And then some interesting things about this. And um, if we want, if you ask me later, I'll talk about the difference between the red and the orange here, but um, we could see with this network graph of, of Twitter accounts and Twitter users. Oh, and I focus on Twitter here because the data is public, but we did do some analysis on other platforms as well, where many of these things lined up, although the actors are often a little bit different. Um, but this is a Twitter network graph and we have sort of the political left or, or, or anti-Trump accounts or pro-Biden accounts were in blue um, and the political right or pro-Trump accounts were in red um, and orange here. And there are some conservative accounts that are anti-Trump that are in the blue here as well. Um, so it's not, it doesn't break up as liberal conservative. It actually breaks up very specifically as pro-Trump and anti-Trump in this case. So we did see some false narratives around voter fraud spreading in the blue section of the graph. If you're not in the United States, you might not have remembered this, but there were a lot of claims leading up to the election around the US Postal Service because Donald Trump had placed in charge his own person in the Postal Service and they were um, the service had gone down in, its, in, in, in terms of its um, efficiency. And they were claims on the left that the US Postal Service was purposefully sabotaging the mail-in voting process, um, including this tweet that said that they were taking the mailboxes out of commission, um, which turns out th this is actually a, um, a, a company that does mailbox refurbishing. And you could go out there today and probably take the same picture. So it actually had nothing to do with the election, but it was taken out of context to use to sort of sow doubt on uh, about the mail-in uh, process on the left. And, and it's spread on the left. So I want to make sure that you know that, that information misinformation isn't purely on the political right. It does spread on both sides. However, when we look at the repeat spreaders, the people who were consistently influential in spreading not just one false narrative, but many different false narratives, those are all from the red section of that graph. They are all highly retweeted uh, um, uh, and folks with very large followings who were pro-Trump accounts. And they include um, the, the, the former president himself, along with his two adult sons. Um, they were the most among the most highly retweeted accounts of any of our misinformation across all of our uh, misinformation, uh, inc we call them incidents, these different different separate claims of, mis of uh, distinct claims of voter fraud that were false or misleading. And we also see accounts of hyperpartisan media outlets and political pundits, uh, conservative activists, and other accounts of like, um, like QAnon leaders and others are in this graph as well. So these and other influencers repeatedly amplifies amplified false and misleading claims of voter fraud. They set and repeatedly reinforced the frame of a rigged election through which their audiences would interpret the events of the 2020 election. And I'm gonna to get to that last part um, soon enough. So 
so we, we see this, the, 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 the disinformation campaign was top down and Bankler and colleagues talk about it as a top down elite driven disinformation campaign. But this campaign was also bottom up with everyday people sharing their own experiences, their own misperceptions of being disenfranchised or finding what they thought to be evidence of voter fraud. And I wanna talk about um, that as well. So I, that, that slide is out of, um, out of so, so, um, uh, so over the course of the fall, so I'm gonna talk about sort of that, that this was also like a, a bottom up uh, dynamic as well. So over the course of the fall leading up to the election, our, our team that was doing live uh, analysis saw numerous sort of what we call incidents or, or, or individual claims or distinct claims um, or false or misleading narratives about mail-in ballots that would, that would suddenly go viral, including lots of different claims about ballots that were being improperly discarded or thrown in a ditch or found in a trash can. And, and together those work just to sow distrust in the mail-in voting process. Sometimes they actually explicitly claimed voter fraud. But here's an example. So it's a photo back from September of 2020. It claims with this photograph that you can see that there are more than a thousand mail-in ballots that have been found in a dumpster. And this was building on this, this, this idea that you can't trust the mail-in voting uh, process. It can't be trusted. And the author ends his tweet, I don't know if any of you, if you study misinformation, you've seen this before, he ends his tweet with the words, big if true. Uh, this speculative trick is sort of common for spreading unsubstantiated rumors online, except of course it wasn't true. Um, the key context here is that um, these envelopes are, uh, they actually don't even have ballots in them, they're envelopes from an election in 2018 and they're being, they're being uh, recycled. And you have to wait some amount of time before you can recycle them. I think it's like 18 months or 20 months. And here it was 20 months after the last election, they're recycling them. So this is a misleading tweet. It's taken a photograph, um, framed it in a, in a false way. Um, and it, but it went viral. It, uh, in, it eventually was tweeted or retweeted more than 25,000 times. Um, and let's look at how um, this claim went viral. These are plots that we were using almost for every incident that we, that we picked up from this collaborative group, our team, every time we picked up an incident, we would plot it in this way so we could see how it went viral. And what these do, this is a cumulative graph um, that shows the cumulative spread of a particular kind of claim. And what it has is on the y-axis is how many times it, it's been shared and on the x-axis is time. And what we do is we plot each tweet on this as a shape, depending on what kind of, like what tweet type it is, if it's a retweet or a quote tweet or whatever. And we size each tweet by the size of the audience of that account. And what this allows us to do is some, not always, sometimes things take off with the random account somehow, but often you'll see these high um, follower accounts change the, the, change the trajectory of a tweet, helping it go viral. So it allows us to see who is really influential in the spread of um, in the spread of a, of a claim. And so here we have the original poster here is a journalist at a, a journalist at a right wing outlet. Um, he, this, this guy, Elijah Schaefer happens to be um, reporting from inside the Capitol building on January 6th, which I find to be interesting. And at one point he was inside Nancy Pelosi's office, but here he is several months earlier, just creating the false narratives that eventually mobilized that same um, event that he got to cover. Um, and then, so his original post was repeatedly retweeted, remixed and reframed as it spread through other uh, influential social media accounts and right and uh, right wing media outlets. Um, there we have like uh, an account of uh, Tim Cast, I think really sort of changes the trajectory and he's a American citizen journalist um, and a political commentator uh, who actually gained influence through his coverage of Occupy Wall Street, but he's now aligned with right-wing populism in the United States. Another influential account in this incident belonged to the Gateway Pundit, a hyper-partisan media outlet that repeatedly spread false or misleading claims of voter fraud. In fact, they, I think they have something like 40 different incidents. Their domain is cited in our data, of 40 different claims of, of voter fraud of different kinds. Um, and uh, eventually this false claim was amplified by the Twitter account of President Trump's son as well, and which is a common kind of piece of the trajectory. Often it would eventually reach some of his closest allies and, and, and family members and, and be promoted from there. So online participants repeatedly activated to produce and spread information that sowed doubt in the election, highlighting irregularities um, and exa exaggerating the, the impact of small issues like stolen mail and spreading false, like absolute falsehoods like this one. Um, 
And it wasn't necessarily because they wanted to mislead people. I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure that everyone's like, oh, I know this is false and I'm putting it in there anyways. But they thought that the information could possibly be true, might be true. They wanted it to be true. And they found it useful for their particular political objectives. And they wanted to gain attention, um, score political points or, or both. Right. So there's reasons that they, they did that. Um, and in part, you know, some of this activity that they did is because they were asked to. So going into the election, um, the Trump campaign campaign explicitly encouraged its audiences to participate in the Army for Trump, where they would go to the polls and document evidence of potential voter fraud. Um, and so I want to um, show you another narrative that emerged from that same thing. And so the 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 first thing I told you was a repeat offenders. The second one I showed you was sort of like a um, a hyper partisan media driven. Um, kind of outlets. So not like your biggest media elites, but a smaller media elite that's that, that's pushing something out or smaller media um, outlet. And this, this one I want to show you, it's very ground up. So this is a narrative that emerged on election day around issues that um, voters were having with Sharpie pens. And it grew into a theory that specifically Trump voters had been disenfranchised by being forced to use Sharpie pens on, on the election day. So the narrative began with a number of people posting stories from different parts of the country. And in the United States, I don't, I don't know how it is there. In the United States, each, each state or locality has its own election procedures. And so there's very different things happening in different places. But um, in several places, they were using Sharpie pens and people were complaining that they would bleed through the ballot. And they were worried that, it, that, that their votes may not have been counted. So officials attempted to correct these concerns on election day. They would explain that the ballots were designed to be used with Sharpie pens, that the bleed through wouldn't affect the vote counting. And what they didn't mention in any of these is actually there's a reason that they use Sharpie pens because they dry fast. So if you're going to feed them into a voter machine, if you use regular ink, it will um, smear the, 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 the thing that reads the, it smears the inside of the, the voting machine and actually that causes a problem. And so they actually designed these things to be used with Sharpie pens and that's why they were asking people to use them so that they wouldn't break their equipment. Um, but these official statements did little to alleviate the concerns which grew as more people shared their fears. Initially, the tone of the Sharpie tweets was one of concern. Like people were worried that their votes wouldn't count and they would give directives to other people to bring their own pen. But as time went on, the content took on a more suspicious tone, reflecting the existing collective belief that the election would be rigged. They'd been told the election would be rigged, and here's the evidence that they um, were expecting to find. Eventually, the discourse shifted to the explicit accusation that this was an intentional effort to disenfranchise specifically Trump voters. And that shift occurred as the content began to take off and go viral. So if you look at sort of a temporal graph of how the term Sharpie spread um, on Twitter, I think we have about 700,000 tweets, and you focus on this section right before it begins to spike and then as it spikes. So there, was a, there were a few thousand tweets on election day. Um, let's see. Yeah, there's a few uh, thousand tweets on election day, but mostly of people concerned about pens bleeding through. But the Sharpie gate narrative really begins to take off um, on election night. Um, about uh, about an hour and a half after uh, the state of Arizona has been called for candidate Biden. And this was unexpected for the Trump campaign. They had actually planned to claim victory and this was disrupting their plans because they weren't expecting Arizona to be called for Biden, especially so quickly. And they actually were expecting to win that state. And um, initially the Sharpie gate thing was about all these different states, but pretty soon it began to be focused just on the state of Arizona and to be uh, spread by, um, by certain accounts that were looking to, to use this, uh, this narrative to kind of support um, their idea that the election was rigged. And so if you look at who these big accounts are, not surprisingly, we see here some of the same right-wing influencers that appeared in our repeat offenders table above, including conservative activist Charlie Kirk and Trump's two adult sons. So these repeat offender uh, accounts were pushing the Sharpie Gate narrative Right, it right as it began to spread widely, um, likely as an explanation for why President Trump had apparently lost to Biden in Arizona. Um, but it didn't start with them, they picked it up. This started, on, this started in the crowd and then they were, it was strategically amplified by these, um, by these uh, large following accounts. So President Trump and his campaign didn't just prime their audiences to be receptive of false narratives of voter fraud. They inspired them to produce those narratives themselves and then echoed those false claims back to them. Social media allow for this two-way exchange 
between populist political elites and their audiences. And this is a powerful dynamic. This isn't someone who's just being told that they've been cheated. This is someone that then goes out into the world and experiences, has this false experience of being cheated. And it, the participants in these narratives became extremely invested in them. And I wanna show you um, this one example of how invested they could be. So on November 4th, the day after the election, Sharpie Gate narrative still spreading widely. It hasn't been effectively debunked. Um, and a number of people begin to share evidence that their vote had been canceled. So um, this, this claim here, the person claims that her ballot, she, she went to vote in person, she voted with Sharpie pen. She didn't really say anything about it at the time, but then she heard that other people, that, that the Sharpies had bled through and their votes hadn't counted. And then she found online that you could go to this site to check whether or not your vote had been counted. And so she went to see if her vote had counted. She finds out it's been canceled. And she sincerely believes that her vote's been canceled because she used the Sharpie pen. And so she tweets this out, gets, gets thousands of likes and, some, and retweets. Except if you look more closely at the image she shared, it's captured from a website that gave people the status of their mail-in ballot which was by law canceled when they voted in person or when they didn't re return their mail-in ballot on time. So this evidence that she says that, that she's showing and that she's feeling uh, shows that her vote has been canceled is false evidence. It actually doesn't show her vote's been canceled. It, her, her, the vote that she gave in person is not, there's no, this doesn't even relate to that, right? So this is a misinterpretation. Um, like so many others from misinterpretations of glitches and statistical anomalies, all these different things, this, but it comes wrapped, it became wrapped in this collective experience of being cheated. And it's one that I think would be very hard to ever correct. These people weren't just told that they would be cheated um, or that they had been cheated. Many of them actually had this false experience of being cheated. And I doubt corrections of these misinterpretations will change the feelings of those experiences. So, Sharpie Gate was one of many different things that emerged on and after election, election day. We had mail-in ballots was the focus of misinformation prior, but afterwards there was a lot of focus on voting machines, claims that voters, voting software were changing votes, claims that the dead, dead, dead people were voting. Um, and all of these are you know, false, misleading. Um, many of them have been debunked. Some are unfalsifiable, but there's no evidence to show that they, they were valid. Um, what became Sh uh, Sharpie Gate soon got wrapped into this larger meta narrative or movement called Stop the Steal, um, a term that had been coined in 2016 by political operative Roger Stone, but it begins to take off on election day in 2020, um, and it continued to be active for months afterwards. And soon the mantra of the Stop the Steal mantra um, began to manifest as a series of in-person rallies around the country. Um, and they were organized by a, a range of people. I'm gonna skip this part. We can come back to if you're interested in some of the, the organization of, of who was pushing Stop the Steal, which included some political figures that are under um, uh, investigation right now for various things in the United States. But the Stop the Steal movement eventually culminated in a grand finale event in Washington, DC, time to coincide with the certification of Joe Biden's victory. And accompanied by rhetoric from many inside the, the movement, including both the leaders and the rank and file, that they would somehow be able to stop the certification. And we're learning more about that in the United States every day, including that you know, they were really coordinating, trying to get um, in particular Vice President uh, Mike Pence from, from certifying the election with this idea that they, they really did think that they were gonna be able to stop it somehow. Um, if, we look, um, if we look at the kinds of profile descriptions of the folks that were participating in this online activism, um, around Stop the Steal, we can actually find thousands of accounts like these. And I, I show you this, I, I've spent way too much time in this data. Maybe, maybe some of you have as well, but um, we see all these accounts of like political partisans highlighting their political identity in their social media accounts. We've got freedom fighters and wives and mothers and military members and Christians and hashtag patriots. Um, and just all, all this, there's, all the profiles are just so, their, sig their social, their political signaling is so strong. And we also saw some visual si symbols. That was a random sampling. This is a more selected sampling, but we could see some of the same visual symbols um, that, that are familiar to us now, American flags and bald eagles, um, pro-Trump imagery, memes from the alt-right. And here and there, we could see in our Twitter data, symbols of the right-wing militia groups that we now know were organized and, and planning to do things on that day. On January 6th, we actually see the, uh, these social media profiles, these ones that 
I once described very naively as online caricatures of political partisans. Um, they, they came to life um, in this violent takeover of the U.S. Capitol building with the hashtag patriots wearing and waving the symbols from their social media profiles and taking real world violent action um, to right this, this per, the wrong of a perceived a misperceived grievance. Um, and so I want to just now step back and, and present this sort of, it, it's preliminary, it's becoming a little less preliminary, um, this model that, that, that I've been working on around participatory disinformation. And it is aligned a little bit with uh, Alicia Wanless and her colleagues, uh, their conception of participatory propaganda. Propaganda always has had these participatory elements. I think our, our conceptualization in 2016 of disinformation was very top down and orchestrated. But when you really look at disinformation, probably historically as well, I, I think we'll find this kind of participat participatory um, dynamic in motion. But these online tools seem to be enabling this dynamic in new ways, which isn't surprising. Uh, uh, digital technology has allowed everything to be participatory. Um, so I wanna just give a kind of a visual explanation here of um, these and explore the dynamics between the political elites and the audiences um, in this phenomenon. So what we saw um, leading up uh, to January 6th um, in, in the US around the election, initially we saw political elites repeatedly spread this message of a rigged election, which set this expectation of voter fraud among their audiences. And this became a frame through which events around the election were interpreted. And the online crowds generated false and misleading stories of voter fraud, reinforcing this frame. Now, sometimes these stories were produced intentionally with knowledge that they were false, but often they were generated sincerely through misinterpretation, as we saw with Sharpie Gate. And then sort of social media influencers and others would help to amplify these stories, passing that content along from the, from the, politi you know, from the audiences up to the political elites. And the political elites would then echo those false and misleading stories back to their audiences, reinforcing that frame, building that sense of collective grievance, and just validating the, these audiences and making them feel like they were part of something, right? So that, that echo effect is very, very powerful. They're saying, I hear you. I hear you. This is, this is something we should all be worried about. And the audiences would echo and, re and reiterate that, that growing sense of grievance and eventually violent language and calls to action increased. And then the political elites were able to mobilize and organize those audiences into protests and rallies. And eventually one of those spun off into the January 6th uh, attack on the Capitol. So again, participatory disinformation makes for a powerful dynamic it's enabled by social media, but it also implicates the broader media ecosystem, such as cable news, hyperpartisan media outlets, as well as some members of the political establishment that are um, purposefully participating in these uh, and have their own sort of a, a, a official communication channels. These tight feedback loops between elites and their audiences seem to make the system more responsive, but may be leading it to spin out of control. And we can see similar dynamics supporting right wing populist movements in many parts of the world, Brazil, India, the Philippines and elsewhere. So this is definitely not a US based phenomenon. It's just something that we were able to, to talk about in this context here. Um, and, and, I, and I don't feel like Donald Trump is, uh, is a cause. I, I really think he's a symptom. I think he's, he was able to use this. He, he, had, uh, he understood how this system worked or he, at least he was able to, to use his, his talents to, to make this work for him, but he's not the only person in, in the world who can do this. I think there's something about these systems that we'll, we will continue to see folks like him take advantage of them unless we can, um, unless we can put a wrench in, in the system. So my sense is that there are current political movements in the US and all around the world that are dependent upon and deeply integrated into these toxic feedback loops. Um, some may feel held hostage to it, Others may understand and embrace that this machine holds the keys to their power. Meanwhile, there's many of us sitting around in these rooms uh, trying to uh, understand uh, in these Zoom rooms and physical rooms for you, trying to, to figure out how we can put a wrench in these systems and stop, and stop this. And I think this is a, a really, I mean, it's a question of our times. Um, for me, I think there's a somewhat defeated sense uh, in, a, in, a, in a few ways. It, it seems like a challenge that's, that's un, insurmountable at times, although I'm, I'm more hopeful some days than others. Um, but there's a piece of it that's like, we're dependent to a great extent upon the social media platforms to somehow fix this. 
uh, which is likely not within their power alone. And we've seen them begin to flirt with improved policies and procedures to take limited action. Um, but we also hear about programs. We've got these leaks that we're, we're, we're working through right now. We hear about programs where instead of holding high visibility repeat as offenders to higher standards, platforms like Facebook have been whitelisting those kinds of accounts um, that are so often influential in the spread of mis and disinformation. Um, so it does seem to me um, like there are things we need to do in government and civil society to push the platforms to make productive change, to make their data more accessible to researchers and the public at large. But we also need to address these problems from other directions, um, including building new civic media literacy programs where we not just give people the tools to help them you know, figure out what's misinformation or not, but we actually give people the, the understanding to realize why they don't really want to become unwitting agents in these um, in these feedback loops that it's actually going to undermine the things they care about in the long run. I don't know how to convince them of that, but I think that's part of our only hope is to convince people they don't want to be unwitting um, spreaders of disinformation. Um, and maybe there are other um, solutions as well, but we certainly need to, I mean, I think it's a, a moment for all of us to come together, uh, um, all hands on deck uh, to do something to kind of stop these toxic feedback loops. Um, for me and, and many of the folks in the United States, I think the events of January 6th and and what, what led up to that and what seems to be, you know, coming ahead, um, make this all too clear that this is sort of, um, this is, this is, in, this is important problem. And, uh, I'm happy, uh, I, I'm done, I'm done with the talk, the talk part. I'm happy to, um, I, I will say that I've been working with the Aspen commission on inf information disorder for the last several months. Our report just came out yesterday. I'm happy to talk about some of the recommendations that we have. Um, for how to address some of these things, um, but also happy to talk about other elements of this talk as well. And I will open it up to questions. Thank you so much, Kate. And I hope you heard some of that applause in the room as well. Um, uh, I know there are a few questions on uh, Zoom and we might have some in the room, but um, maybe if we start with one of the ones from Zoom, uh, Esan or Michelle, if you could read one out. Sure. I'm going to start with a question from Max Grumping. Uh, actually, two questions after thanks, Kate. Uh, the first question is that some scholars call the disinformation discourse a moral panic, saying that exposure to disinformation is relatively low compared to accurate information and that it is also not very persuasive. Uh, uh, but January 6th would suggest different. So what do we know about the impacts of disinformation on attitudes or preferences? such as eroding beliefs in electoral integrity. And the second question would be uh, whether this information is purely top-down or also two-way, because we have also seen examples of disinformation campaigns that aim to shore up trust in institutions such as pro-government propaganda. Uh, I think both of these are interesting questions. Um, the first one really, I My, my sense of, of these things is I haven't, I haven't seen evidence that we can create a study that can measure some of the impacts that we're seeing. It's difficult because I've seen a lot of research papers. So we went to look for how this changes, you know, did they were exposed to a troll and it didn't change their preferences. And, and the thing about it is it's, it's so much more complicated than one exposure to one false message or one troll. It, and it's so much more than even what we can see um, in, in some of these environments. Um, so the, it's difficult to measure the impact of these things because I think there's so many um, indirect effects uh, that, that are, are hard to tease out. And there's no control case where we know what the world would look like without some of the things that, that we're seeing. Um, for me, things like January 6th were, were, you know, I don't think there's another explanation um, are we going to go back and say, oh, this person was exposed to this troll, therefore they were there or not? That's never going to happen. But we do know that, you know, in retrospect, talking to a lot of the, in the interviews of a lot of the folks that were there that day, you know, their online activities were part of, were a huge part of what motivated them to be there that day. Um, and a lot of them were motivated by the misinformation that they were, they were seeing in those environments. Um, but you're never going to tease that back to one Donald Trump tweet or one article from the Gateway Pundit because it was all there was so many other things. It, it was all co-produced. There was so much, you know, production that that wasn't, you know, it couldn't tie directly to any campaign because it was both top down and bottom up. 
Um, and so I think it's really, it, it's gonna, it's always gonna be difficult. I've heard these, these, these things about, I, I wish it was a moral panic. I would love to be like, oh, this is all gonna go away and, and these things are gonna be normal again. But we're seeing, you know, in the US, you know, around vaccines and other kinds of things that, that people aren't, you know, we're, we're not getting, uh, misinformation is causing people to, to be vaccine hesitant and choose not to get them, which is, have, you know, is having horrible impacts and the loss of life. Um, and we can map that to, to political p- political ideology, which maps a little bit to some of the misinformation about vaccines right now. I think we do have a lot of evidence right now that this stuff is toxic and it's infecting people, um, but affecting people, excuse me. But there's, um, but it's difficult to just put it in a quantitative study and have it be so simple and come out in, in a paper. I think we're gonna have to think more holistically about things and 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 recognize the evidence that we have without without having to all have it all fit into a mathematical experimental model that comes out in, in a research paper. Um, on the other side, absolutely. I think, um, I mean, the, the, the flip side that a lot of us in these democratic societies are, are trying to grapple with is as we try to grapple with this particular problem, around mis and disinformation, undermining trust, what happens when those rules become underneath a power structure where an authoritarian leader is using those same kinds of mechanisms to prevent them from being challenged. And so um, there is this sort of tension between you know, it, it seems right now that a lot of these systems are, are supporting the rise of these populist leaders. Um, and yet um, a, a more closed system would, would sort of reify and strengthen an authoritarian leader who had already had power. And so there are these really hard questions, especially when we think about platform changes or governance, like what will this look like if, you know, if we begin to shift more towards authoritarian leadership in some of these places, will there be a point of no re- return because we've, we've actually um, closed off some of the democratic discourse that would be needed to, to fight back against those things. And I am, um, th- th- those are other things that keep me up at night um, if I needed a couple more. Do we have any questions in the room, Dan? Thank you so much, Kate. It's Dan Angus here. Um, Look, a lot of your presentation relied on visuals, and I couldn't help escape but the potency of the visual in a lot of these examples. You you spent a lot of time talking about the iconography, um, but also specific examples of of misinformation um, around things like the postal ballots and and, and very false and misleading images. Um, Are you able to expand much further on that, about the power of these images in their spread? Is it that images kind of aid in the spread of particular narratives more so than relying simply on text, um, perhaps even extending out to videos. Like how are these modalities themselves implicated in the the kind of virality and spread of these particular messages? Yeah, my research hasn't looked at that directly. Certainly we use them in our in our investigations. We use them to understand things and we use the, our own, you know, we use network graphs and other kinds of things to communicate about the research we do. But in terms of studying the images and their role within some of these um, environments, we know that images are stickier than text um, in the sense that, well, first of all, they often take up more space in the social media platform. So, um, so that alone gives them more, you know, more stickiness. Um, although some people are trickier with their text and try to take it, have it take up more space now to, to play with that. But, um, but also there does seem to be something about images that, that drive up engagement. Um, and certainly there are elements of human psychology that inter- interact with images differently. That's not the kind of research I do. So I would have, I, and I, and I, can't cite specific things, but certainly images are a huge part of like mimetic culture and the spread of disinformation often leverages images and puts text over them. Images are also harder to study than text. Um, They're harder for us to process at scale than text. They're harder to moderate than text. And then we have to multiply that by some other massive factor when we get to videos. Um, And a lot of the social media environments now are video based. Like if you talk to anybody, all of my student projects this quarter, they've all chose to be around TikTok. Um, every third presentation I've seen this week is around TikTok. Um, and, and so that short video content, 
is really becoming um, a primary sort of um, focus of, of social media interactions. And of course, um, wherever the social media interactions are, the disinformation will be there as well. And so, um, yeah, some really, I, I wish I had more answers to like what the, uh, all I can say is there are really important questions open uh, in that area. If you're a researcher, I think um, focusing on visual content, how we, will we conduct research on it? How will we do it at scale? Um, how are people interacting with that content? Uh, I think it's really, really important um, piece of what's going on here. I might just blatantly jump in there and ask a question as well, Kate. Um, you mentioned that a lot of what you presented obviously was from Twitter, but you've also looked at other platforms. So what's the mix of platforms and what, what dynamics do you see there between them? Um, oh gosh, <laughs> the cross-platform dynamics. We have a whole chapter about that in the 400 page report. I can send you out to that, but um, certainly we've been looking at, um, uh, you know, Twitter was a place where, uh, where President Trump or Donald Trump prior and, 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 and Donald Trump while he was president used that very effectively. So in studying the 2020 election, I think there's always limitations for being there, but I, I think that's the last, the last major event that we can be Twitter, Twitter first on because you know it's a quirky site, it's mostly journalism. It does sort of set, there's an agenda setting that happens there. Um, and it's a place that, that stuff is mobilized, but a lot of where, where the places where things are organized, that's happening in private Facebook groups, Telegram chats, uh, you know, um, uh, some of these other places that we don't go into as much um, or are harder to access. And, and certainly we can't study in the same way because it's not public data. Um, and the intersection is that it gets organized there and then it gets mobilized on a platform like Twitter where they can drive up trending topics or they kind of push it out through, through Facebook public groups once they've organized in private groups. Um, we see a lot, a lot of the, the repeat spreaders in our data set were working cross platform. So they had a, a Facebook strategy, a Twitter strategy and a YouTube strategy and they would use them in complementary ways. They would post a, a video on YouTube and then they would link to it from their Twitter account, from their Facebook account, and try to, um, and then we would see a campaign around it to try to drive it spread on, on those different um, platforms. Um, TikTok isn't as well connected. It's almost its own environment right now, although we do see TikTok videos picked up and, and reposted and mobilized on Twitter. But I think TikTok really is, is driving its own, own, um, own content um, but I, I could be wrong about that. My, my research on TikTok is limited. Um, we're really interested in other sites. We're interested in like Telegram. A lot of folks have moved over to Telegram where, where there are some public, public meetups and also private ones. And um, as, as, as the tactics get more sophisticated and as, um, as folks begin to lose access to the major platforms due to suspensions, we will probably see this more sort of like spread across different places and, and it's going to be even more complicated to, to study it, which is going to give new opportunity for researchers who can come up with creative ways of studying the cross-platform dynamics. But it's such an important part of the question is to look at how these things are, are not just in different places, but different sites are using complementary ways. Fantastic, thank you. This might be a good place to just put a plug in to say that Patrick Wickström, Bondi K, and Jing Zeng has, have a book coming out on TikTok. Um, so uh, everyone on Zoom, keep an eye out for that as well. Have we got another question on Q&A? Yes, question from Gary Campbell. Uh, just wondering what media organizations can do to help tackle misinformation on social media. There's a bit of tension between addressing and correcting misinformation in Facebook comments, for example versus just hiding or deleting those comments? Yeah, we've, there's been a huge, I mean, this is ongoing conversation of like, if we attend to it, are we, you know, are we giving it more attention? It's like the Streisand effect or whatever. It, by, by, by correcting it, are we actually exposing more people to it than would have seen it? Or are we, are we um, you know, does, when do, when do you address something versus when do you ignore it? I think that conversation has been going on in U.S. journalism for a long time. Around QAnon, it was a huge conversation. Um, they're like, should we cover it? Should we cover it? No, we shouldn't cover it. Oh, my gosh. Now it's, it's every, you know, it's a, a massive spread of this thing and it's too late. We should have covered it before. So there was some, there's some real interesting conversations there. Um, and I don't think there's, a, there's one answer to that. I really... You know, there's something about pre-bunking, but you don't want to expose people to things 
beforehand if they're not going to see them and it could cause them to have doubt. Um, there are, I think fast debunking is probably the right way to go, but like, when do you cover it is like, if it's only spread a little bit, do you wait until you think it's really about to go viral or when do you, and I don't think we know the answers to that. I, I think there's still a lot of debate that needs to happen on, um, on the kind of thing you're trying to address and, and when you address it. Um, one thing we did leading up to the election was we, we actually were, we pre- we did a like what to expect on election night where we called out the kinds of things that we expected to happen due to, we knew there was going to be uncertainty. We knew that there were going to be this, these shifts based on the fact that a lot of Democrats had voted with mail-in ballots and a lot of Republicans hadn't because they didn't trust the mail-in ballots because they listened to their messaging. And so we knew there were going to be some shifts when the, when the different ballots were counted based on when, when States counted the mail-in ballots. And, and so we kind of like predicted all these different kinds of, narratives that we saw, most of them were kind of came true. But as we did it, we, we talked to, um, you know, talk to journalists about how they might want to cover a claim that hit in some of those places. So, um, so that, that they could kind of, they could develop a strategy before they came across that moment and try to handle it a little bit better. Um, things like um, this understanding that, that it was kind of known that Donald Trump was going to claim victory, even if he hadn't won. And there was a whole way that they had, that the journalists kind of came together and figured out how they would report on that in a way that didn't then lead to more confusion later when people were claiming he hadn't won. So they didn't want there to be contested things. So I think there's a, some room to just kind of uh, spec out. Like if you know that there's going to be an event that's going to have these elements of, of, of disinformation to kind of, to kind of think about for your um, outlet or your media organization, how you might deal with some of these different narratives that you might, might expect around that. I think it's going to be really important for like Brazil right now are they're facing some of the same kinds of claims of voter fraud and same kind of elite driven disinformation campaign by the, the current president and his son. And I think for the media there to kind of pre, you know, kind of get things ready um, to, to quickly debunk and have strategies for certain kinds of claims re- ready, I think would be really important. We've been telling election officials to like put out a page that tells people why they use Sharpie pens ahead of time so we can point to that. Because it took me six months to figure out that the reason they use Sharpie pens is because the other pens um, make the machines, uh, cause the machines not to work. It, it's really hard to find that information anywhere. And so had that information been available, it might've been easier to debunk that um, on election day and not have it go viral and become part of the stop the steal um, uh, collection of, of false narratives. So, so preemptively put out good information that, that, that fact checkers can use to, to look to, to cite when a false narrative is spreading might be one one strategy that could be helpful. But we can't predict all misinformation before it happens. So it, it's not the single solution. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, we're almost out of time. Um, so one last question, perhaps, what's next for you in your research? Where, where are you taking all of this from here? Oh gosh, well, we're, we're building out that, re- that rapid response model. We're actually trying to understand um, not just on the, the research side, but h- how do we assemble collaborations that when we, when we know we have an event that's coming like another election where we expect these kinds of things, how do we collaborate with, with researchers and election officials and journalists and others to, to quickly like identify things and then think about how do we you know, answer these questions of how do we best communicate these folks, how and when and in what format do we best communicate this folks to, to try to stem some of the um, some of the spread of, of these these har- these harmful claims? You know, not all misinformation is bad, but when it's harmful, when it erodes trust in in democracy, when it seems to be pushing us in in directions towards authoritarian leadership and in other kinds of places, pu- causing public ha- health harms. Um, how do we kind of address that with collaborations? Is one of the things we're working on at the at the Center for an Informed Public at UW. And with so many other questions, <laughs> um, because I'm a director of a center, I, I don't get to have my hands directly in a lot of the research anymore, but there's so many good folks uh, on our team doing things uh, from, from vaccine related misinformation to election related misinformation to misinformation targeting particularly particular communities that have been historically marginalized um, and others as well. And I think there's, there's a lot of um, questions. 
Brilliant. Thank you so much, Kate. It's, it's been really fantastic to listen to you. This has been a, an, an excellent start to our day. Um, so thank you very much again. Maybe we can all give Kate a hand for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, by all means, feel free to stick around, of course, if, you, if you'd like to see some of our other presentations. And that goes for everyone else on Zoom, of course, too. Uh, we're going to take a very quick morning tea break, 15 minutes. Sorry, we've got such a packed program that we keep these breaks very quick. So do get out, grab your tea, grab your morning tea, and let's get started again at 10.30. <laughs>